All right, let's get right into it to uh, Polly Stories. Can you introduce yourself? My name is Tanya Dolta'u. I am 33 and <laughs> I'm from East Palo Alto, California. Hey, EPA. Yep. And what was another question? Uh, ethnicity. Ethnicity. I'm obviously Tongan, um, half Tongan, and my dad's Fijian, so. Okay. All right, a little bula we knock over mm -hmm. there. Okay. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So, uh, how was your childhood growing up? <coughs> Where you from? Um, childhood was pretty decent for mine. Very family oriented. Grew up in a large family. Where'd you, um, where'd you grow up? I was born out here in Burlingame, okay. but I was raised in Tonga for the first four years of my life, and then okay. when I was old enough to come to school or like go to attend school, I grew up in Hawaii and, um, in Maui okay. from elementary, middle school, and then I went to high school or like ninth grade in Tonga. Okay. Yeah. Where'd you go to school in Tonga uh, when you were little? Did you? What school? When I was in Tonga? Yeah. I think I went to this primary school um, called Mataho. Oh, okay. GPS Mataho. Yeah. <laughs> um, that little, it was like a, like preschool, like preschool. the equivalent of preschool. And yeah. then I came from there and went to kindergarten went in to kindergarten. Maui. Went yeah. to Maui? Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Um, did you did you did did, uh, did you still remember the, when you moved uh, from Tonga to uh, to Hawaii? Uh, did you still remember that or not really? Because that's yeah, pretty like pretty early. Recollections of that time mm -hmm. during my childhood is very sparse. Like I barely remember. Oh, okay. Things. Yeah. Good. Did your whole family? Did your whole family move with you, or was it you were the only one? It was me and my grandparents because I was sent to my grandparents and I'm sure this is like you know the same situation for a lot of yeah. kids where uh, you're taken to the islands and raised by your mother or father's relatives and yeah. parents while they work yeah um, but that was the case so when I moved back from Tonga it was more like my grandma or my grandpa or both coming with me to bring me back to my parents oh, okay yeah. that's cool. actually I could actually grew up the same way when I, when I lived in Tonga I grew up more, I grew up my grandma raised me it was me and uh, 25 other, <laughs> other cousins. Really? They all live in the same house. And grandma, man, she's a soldier. <laughs> so they, they don't make them like that. They don't make them like that. My grandma, my grandma was like the strongest woman I know. But uh, I don't know how she did it. But mm -hmm. she but, did then, it. but then when we and when our parents was able to financially be able to take care of us, then we moved back. Right. All right, that's cool. All right, so um, so when you uh, so you moved to so you moved to um, uh, Hawaii, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, Hawaii. Is that how you say? It? <laughs> Either or. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we. Um, how how was that? How was that growing up um, in the states? Uh, uh, do you remember, uh, remember any, anything? Anything when you grew up? I think what stands out to me was the fact that I was not able to speak yeah. a word of English at yeah. all. Full tongue, eh? Full tongue, it. <laughs> you know. Um, I guess it was also a, a huge culture shock for me yeah. that I could not interact with other adults, especially within the academic settings, um, in a way that I was used to back in Tonga, or yeah. at least yeah. in primary school, yeah. because they would interact with you both, you know, they're bilingual, so yeah. they speak to you either in Tongan or English, so you were able to communicate to an extent. Yeah. Um, I grew up in um, Maui, and anyone who has been to Hawaii, or at least have grown up and gone to school in, in anywhere in Hawaii, yeah. know that it's um, like uh, your teachers, they're obviously not representative of Pacific Islanders. Or, yeah. yeah. Well, not teachers there. I, um, I had, throughout my whole elementary and middle school, all my teachers were Japanese. Japanese? Japanese. Oh, wow. There's a huge population yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've seen that when I used to go uh, visit. Yeah. So all my teachers were Japanese. So, and the reason why I'm pointing that out was because there was just no way to communicate. So like the first couple of years, or at least the first in kindergarten, I had my own little designated spot in the classroom space where they would let me just pretty much nap throughout yeah. the whole entire class, like throughout the whole entire day, mm -hmm. just because there was like no communication at all. Like yeah. they didn't understand what I needed. I couldn't vocalize what I needed. Mm -hmm because I didn't speak their language. So it was just a, a very, it was like a very traumatizing time for me and pretty much became, I guess, the fuel to my fire to do what I do, which is obviously teach. Teach, yeah. okay. All right. 
Uh, how long did you, before it took you to learn uh, English? Oh boy, <laughs> you know, like at that age. So basically, according to um, some educational psychologists, I think it's Vygotsky, um, there is this time where you have proximal development and up to age 11, mm -hmm. that's the time where you're like a sponge. Mm -hmm. So thankfully, in a kindergarten, I guess I wasn't speaking any, but I was absorbing everything. So first grade, I was getting report cards like, uh, Tanya's doing this, she's good, but she talks too much. Yeah. So already by first grade, just from just that trans that one year transition, I was like, I was able to pick up all the language and be able at least to master it to an extent where I could communicate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you go up in a in a, in Hawaii? Was there like a was there a Tongan community? There was a huge Tongan community. Where you grew up in Hawaii? In Maui yeah. and and like in pretty much Maui, Oahu, and like so the bigger bigger islands in mm -hmm. Hawaii than Kauai. There's a big population there. And mind you, it's Hawaii. They're a Pacific Islander yeah. as well. So yeah. there's a lot of correlations. And like, honestly, you feel at home. Yeah, you know, at because home. I, can, I can imagine so. Yeah. Because there are Pacific Islanders and there are also other Pacific Island communities there. And it's like also, also a huge group. So, yeah, it was, yeah. Okay. You know, people you could relate to. So you, you grew up with a lot of talents in uh, Maui? Yes. Yeah. Oh, and everybody was your cousin, <laughs> even though that was not the reality. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I know, yeah. I know. And <laughs> everybody's your cousin. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, did you, uh, what, do, what do you think, in your, in your opinion, like was like the hardest thing uh, as far as your transition, uh, going from Tonga and uh, coming here to live in the United States, in your opinion, as, as a Tongan female? What do you think is like was the hardest thing for you? If there is, okay. Um, I apologize. I'm going to take a little bit of time to just process that question because it's a very heavy, yeah. like, like heavily yeah. laden question. Um, of course, one of the things would be language. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, not only as someone who speaks English as a second language, but as a female, mm -hmm. um, the way you express yourself is also something that could be a struggle for you as a Tongan, oh, for me as a Tongan female, okay, you know, um, the way our boys, not making any assumptions, but the way our boys, our Tongan boys are able to express themselves is so much more different than the way girls can express themselves. You know, okay. we're expected to act a certain way, respond a certain way or not yeah. to certain situations. And so I feel like that, um, that was a struggle. Um, I guess transitioning into an environment where uh, your voice in Tonga not needed at all. Yeah. You know? In America, totally different. Your teachers yeah. like ask questions, you know. Yeah. And I still struggle to this day with that, you know, because yeah. it's hard for me to kind of find a or like draw a line between like being Tongan enough and being americanized enough you know like because like again yeah. going back to that okay okay perfect aspects. can you uh can you like ex like um talk about some experiences like you said um and i and i get that because you know i'm talking too so uh i've seen it oh, where you know yeah. as we there's different ways we get treated and how we express ourselves as men mm -hmm. uh, but I, it's not the same when it comes to um you know to the females in my family mm -hmm. Um, but can you talk about that? Like, um, experiences growing up where you wanted to, cause, uh, you wanted to express yourself, mm -hmm. um, and you felt like you, it was kind of detrimental. It's like, you just felt kind of like you couldn't, it was, uh, as far as like, you know, you know, made you feel kind of, like you said, you didn't feel talented enough or, if, or you just felt like your voice, your voice wasn't heard and you felt some type of way about it mm -hmm. that kind of affected your, you know, your happiness or your mindset. Like, can you talk about that as far as like, what kind of specific experiences that you saw okay. growing up? So, I guess the experiences, the first instance I could think about is like, um, as a Tongan female, where your voice is not, um, you know, something that's valued or required. Um, the first experience I had, or like, just being plain female, I guess, kind of, shapes that particular uh, experience but the first one I had was um, where I noticed my grandma or like I heard, overheard my grandma tell my mom to hold my sibling 
who was still an infant at the time, that my dad should not hold her at okay. the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then um, eventually, um, throughout that day, I was really curious about this. I was yeah. like, you know, and I guess this not this is not necessarily expression in terms of vocalizing, yeah. but like expression just in the way we interact. Yeah. You know, in our in our cultural circles, especially back in the islands. Mm-hmm. I was really upset by this. I was old enough to the point where I was just like, I started questioning, you know, I questioned that. I was like, Grandma, why did you tell my mom to take baby? You saw my mom was carrying, you know, another kid. Like, why are you telling like my mom to take the baby and not have my dad do that? Like, yeah. that's his child too. Yeah. And my grandma's like, no, it is, it is bad to have um, a, a man hold the child. Especially in church or oh. stuff that I guess, I guess what my grandma was saying was that it's demeaning to his, mas- his masculinity. Mas- masculinity, yeah, masculinity yeah. If he is holding a child, wow, that's and being a father, yeah, you know, and that to me just like I guess was the beginning of the end for me, where I just started to like thaw away at this ideal femininity that was shaped by our culture. What was her first? Them. What was her first thoughts, if you remember, when she said that? Like, what was like? Your first like I was angry. Angry, You're angry. And I emotional. was like, first of all, my sibling is fifty percent my mom. Yeah, and fifty percent my dad's. Mm-hmm. He has every right. You know what I mean? Yeah. He has a responsibility to this child just as much as my mother does. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and like all love to my dad and stuff, but like that, like that kind of gave me like it was like a rude awakening for me. Yeah. Um, to kind of be aware of the roles, the roles of men and women in in the tongue culture and the yeah. talking context and yeah. I was from then I started to notice and be more aware of different things um but yeah I'll okay. stop there no that's fine that's fine all right um no that's actually no, that's pretty uh that's no nowadays like like you say it's uh, like it's 50 50 mm-hmm. right you know uh, you know a, a guy should be able to take care of his kids just like uh, as a mom, mm-hmm. um, did you ever see other uh, besides that experience? Like, did you see any other, uh, any other experience besides that one that you do remember? I guess another one is um, going to school. Like this later, this is actually the one that kind of like I remember at this time. Mm-hmm. I know there are better examples, and no, I yeah. apologize. This no, it's is fine the one that. that I can recall. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, is it often? I used I used to often question why it was that because i went to the only all tongan girls yeah. school for those who are not familiar um why is it that as part of our curriculum we were taught to knit and sew okay you know what i mean yeah yeah and they sold that to make a profit for the school to kind of help with everything that was going on um and maintain facilities etc um and then like yeah we were taught those things you know kind of conform to the gender roles of like women stay home you're supposed to know how to knit like a like the ideal Tongan woman should know how to do all these you know all these I guess like to knit to sew etc um and I used to question that yeah you know I used to question it my mom was like you know what if you don't want to do it I'll just go buy one and then you can turn that in as your final product because like she couldn't answer my questions you know and I it used to it used to bother me because I wanted to know why, if I don't want to do that, yeah. why don't I have other opportunities to explore something that I would like? Maybe, as women, yeah. how about if I, I want to make kava cups? Because that's yeah. what Toloa boys would do. Yeah. You know, how about if I want to make kava cups? Or like, fi a kafa. Yeah. Or any of those things. Yeah. Okay. Why does it have to be, we are only boxed into this little space where we can we're only expected to do this yeah. to perform up to this certain standard yeah. of meeting and making the high beetles and all that yeah. crap and then just being a wo- like <laughs> they're they're exactly. uh, preferred tongue and woman right yeah. like and um but yeah but that was another experience later on in life um where what you, uh when that happened with your uh, when your grandma said that to your mom right mm-hmm. did you uh do you know what your mom, what your mom felt? Did, was she was she did she just obediently obey, or did she, did you see that she wanted to say something, but she just kept it in and just just did what her grandma said? Did you see anything? Like her did you see? Do you remember how your mom responded, right? or is anything you that she said to you? Honestly, I don't remember how yeah. my mom responded, but my dad continued to carry the child, or like my sibling. Yeah. So, um, 
maybe my mom made an attempt to take my sibling and my dad was like no I don't conform and I guess that's one of like this like the blessings in our family was because my dad did not choose my dad he was he was something else he yeah. was a merrick he did his own thing like yeah. you know he did not conform yeah. to like whatever ideals and roles that were assigned to so you didn't listen to grandma <laughs> he did not <laughs> Well, it was based because, well, because of mom, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, no, I see you, you're with the kids, I'm gonna do this, I can do this, yeah, this is yeah. my child too. Like, yeah. so I was really happy with that, but it kind of, you know, turned a wheel in my head where I continued to notice little examples of it all around. Okay. All right, no problem. So, so you, so you, that was your first experience, right? Um, gender roles, right? Mm -hmm. Seeing that they're trying to box you way into a specific person. Mm -hmm. Maybe that that's not a person you you want to become because mm -hmm. you're own you're every part everybody's their own person mm -hmm. right everybody has their own voice own life all right so um, what do you, in your experience what do you think that does to a, a tongue girl um, like uh, especially when somebody like you say you want to do something else right so how did you like how did you cope with that like was it really hard to like to eventually, because you, did you just say, you know what, I'm doing this, this is who I am, I'm not listening to it, or was it like a process of it kind of, fi of finding yourself, yeah, right? Sorry for interrupting. No, go ahead. Yeah, it was definitely a process. Um, it was definitely a process. Uh, How do you, yeah, I'm you more talk, yeah. super obedient, you know, like I was way more obedient back then. Yeah. Um, but it was definitely a process. Because I feel like every kid goes like that, right? Yeah. Um, for me, like, I'm, I'm, really, I'm like I said, I'm really expressive too, all mm -hmm. right? But we all go through the process of obedience. Yes. You know, that's how we're taught. That's <laughs> all right. I'm learning that a lot. All right. That's but then at some point in our life, we realize, look, this is, number one, I'm not happy doing this. Mm -hmm. Like, this is kind of detrimental to how I feel, mm -hmm. you know. And then you start realizing as, as you grow older, I got to do what I got to do for myself mm -hmm. to have, a, to, be, to be sane. Yeah. Just to, just to, Especially to be sane. <laughs> just, to, you know, just to be at peace. Mm -hmm. All right. So can you talk about that process of uh, what, you, what you had to do for yourself before it was like any self-affirmation, was self-love? What, what did you do to come to, like, to that point where you just had to find your peace being yourself? First of all, um, let me say that that journey and that pathway in my life is not fully there yet. Yeah, I haven't yeah, read, of course, or that's like life. reached the culmination yeah, of that yeah, yet. Yeah. Um, but I do know that I am um, further along that path than I was, you know, a couple of years ago, yeah. and especially in high school, um, where I would question, but then when I like when I got a response, you know, I was like, okay, I'm just not gonna. I'm not gonna, I guess, stoke this fire because yeah. conflict. That's like usually something that we don't want to get into, yeah. especially with our, with our elders. You yeah. know, we don't want conflict with them, or like. But anyways, so at the beginning stages, I was like, um, I would easily be appeased by little or none or no answers. Like I would be like, like if they tell me, I'm the no idea or. Yeah. It would easily appease me for that time being, yeah. but it didn't necessarily mean that I wouldn't ask Again. another question later. You know, didn't dwell on like it, my curiosity, yeah. like my curiosity about this, like continued to remain alive, and I felt like it just, you know, expanded over time. Especially when I wasn't getting the answers that gave me closure, yeah, or answers that made sense to me. So how did you make sense? How how did you make a sense for yourself? Just to just to like be at peace with yourself. How did you make sense? I guess first of all I realized that the way I make meaning for myself is is valid. It's important. Yeah. And it's and it's justified, you know? Like no one else should have that power of making meaning for you but yourself. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to get there you know mm -hmm. I felt like at that point I'd allowed everyone else like in my in my in my family you know in my familial circle circle to interpret things for me yeah and then have that be my meaning when that wasn't exactly you know how I would have interpreted it yeah but eventually over time when I realized that my voice was valid and important enough I was good enough to be able to interpret and make meaning of the things that are happening around me yeah it then became something where 
I would just trust my own judgment and trust my own perspective and trust my own interpretations of things according to my experiences, of course, as I continue to expand those experiences, you know? Um, but yeah, when I realized that it was okay, I was important, like my voice mattered and it was valuable enough to be able to interpret what was happening in my life and my experiences, mm -hmm. then it was like, oh damn, like, it was like a wake up call for me. Mm -hmm. And it became my go-to, you know, like, yeah, instead of seeking others to interpret stuff for me, I relied on myself. Okay. And it's never done me wrong, so. <laughs> Right. Must be doing something right. Okay. If that answered your question. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. It didn't. No, no, it did. It did. Okay. Okay. Did. I'm sorry. So you just you just came to a realization mm -hmm. um, that you know your uh, your voice mattered. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Was it? Did you have to? Did you have to spend a a lot of time by yourself by yourself figuring that out, or, or did you get a lot of support from your from from your family to give you that courage to be confident in your own uh, voice? I think most of it came from my from my family. Yeah. I I was raised by my mom's, um, so my maternal side. Yeah. At the time I was sent back to Tonga, I was um, all my mom's sisters, my mom's the oldest of five, mm -hmm. and all my mom's sisters at the time were not married. Okay. So I grew up with adults. Oh, so you, so you went to Hawaii and you moved back to Tonga? Again? No, 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 when I was a baby. Oh, baby, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, um, they are very vocal women, very opinionated, mm -hmm. very expressive mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. And it's because my grandpa raised them that way. Okay, thank you. you know, okay. my grandpa raised them that way. Um, pretty much m changed up the whole narrative for Tongan women by uh, injecting education as what a woman should strive for, as opposed to striving to be married. Yeah, you know, yeah, see that's like that's the ultimate ultimate goal of a, like a your, Tongan that, woman. That's life. like the ultimate pinnacle of your life as a Tongan woman. It's just and marry and, and have kids. And have kids. Like, and if you if you achieve that, then that's it. You've like done. You've done, you've done your done enough. You've done, you've done your purpose in life. <laughs> I cannot roll my eyes anymore for that. But then, okay. I've seen that. <laughs> no, I see that. I see that a lot. No, I see. Yeah. I see no, I see, honestly, I see that a lot with people, friends, and uh, families where I hear yeah. conversations. You know, you know, these are and these are these are girls like high school. Yeah, and I'm not demeaning. And, the no, there's nothing. Look, look, every, just, everybody, everybody. everybody is entitled to their life. Yeah. If that's your goal and that what makes you, you just, just want to be a, a six day at home mom, hey, do you, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. But exactly. For but I know the difference between an idea that's not theirs. It's, it's been implanted implanted. Because a lot of these girls I could have cousins and I used to, a lot of these girls are, you know, they're about to go to college, they have so much you know, they're about to get down. I I can tell they can make it far in life, but it's just they have this belief that um they just they think that that's the ultimate goal, mm -hmm. and they never kind of take strides towards. Or sometimes I can tell that they, there's things they they want to like I said they, I can tell they want to speak their opinion and voice something about something they want to do for themselves, but they always fall back and say anything because they think that, okay you know this is going this is going against my mm -hmm. my purpose of just getting married. And, mm -hmm. But I saw I feel that when you said that that kind of was oh man I saw I see that all, all the time with like Tonga women. Yeah, like cause you like let's be real like. If you continue to allow people around you to interpret your meaning of life and your perspective and shape that for you, yeah. it's going to get to a point where you're going to stop questioning and you're going to accept it for yeah. truth, mm -hmm. as truth, yeah. you know? When in reality, it, it probably is not. Especially when I ask them the question, hey, so what do you want to do with your life, right? You know, oh, I just, well, you know, I just, I just want to get married, have kids. <laughs> <All right. laughs> like, that's, I, know, I know that's not your answer. I know that's not their true answer. Yeah. When people and kids say that, because I know as kids we dream, and as kids we have ideas, aspirations. Yes. Um, so when uh, so you, you grew up in a in a household with uh, with your aunties, right? Very opinion, very opinion, opinionated women, and powerful. They encourage you to be to be open, expressive. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember <coughs> to everything else but them? Yeah. <laughs> so I did that with everything, yeah. but, but talk back to them yeah. or my grandparents. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Do you remember, uh, like, because I know, because I, I can relate to you what you said, right? Because I'm very expressive opinion of myself. But when you're younger, you learn to pick and choose mm -hmm. your, your battles, right? You can't just express it all the time. You know, you know, you know, you're going to go with your get, mouth pop? <laughs> exactly. You're going to be missing two front <laughs> Exactly. Or, you know, it's going to be okay. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. so you pick and choose. Yeah. We, have, we have to pick and choose, right? But 
sometimes there uh, was there any time that you just you just have to you just have to see something. Oh, just pause right there. Boom. How was that? Twenty five minutes. Sorry. All good. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so you talked about your journey of uh, finding your voice, learning to understand that your voice was valid and had meaning. Um, I can relate to that because I know uh, when you go through that journey, you have to learn to pick your battles, right? <laughs> uh, you can't just express yourself, especially to talk with uh, elders every single time because you know someone die, you go, <laughs> someone's gonna get hit, smacked up. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Um, so, do you have an experience of a time that uh, those you wanted uh, you you saw something or something that you wanted to do for yourself, um, and you and you just and if one of your family members disagree with it, and they tell you what to do of the, of of, of, uh, of their opinion of how you, of how they want you to act, but you just have to like, tell them, hey, no, and you have to stand up for yourself and express how you feel, and this is something I want to do for my life. Did you do. You, have any experiences of recollection about that? Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to share? I remember um, this one situation where <clears throat> me and my grandfather, um, and mind you, this man, like I mentioned earlier, he is the only human on this earth that I've ever wanted to please. Cool. My parents didn't matter. Mm -hmm. My aunties didn't matter. I mean, I love them to death, yeah. but we all have that, he we all, was that one person. We all have that role model in yes. our life that we want to please and yeah. become. Gotcha. I left, he, he sat on a pedestal yep. for me yep. and remained there up until the day he passed, yep. you know? Mm -hmm. um, so everything I wanted to do pretty much had to be filtered through him. Through him. Yep. And the way I interpreted a lot of things and the way I reacted and responded to certain situations yep. was because of him. Yeah. He was his voice was something you respected. Yeah. His voice was my voice. Yeah. Until I found mine. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. he w he was my voice. I like that. You know, mm -hmm. um, he was my truth. Mm -hmm. You know, when I couldn't interpret what that was for me, he was that for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I adored him to uh, the craziest extent, and so everything I did um, was to please my grandpa. You know, mm -hmm. to make him proud of me. Mm -hmm. You know, just to clarify. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so there was this one time. So I never talked back to him. Obedience to him yeah. was, I felt, was, that, was, was like requirement. my divine calling. You, you, you know, to. my divine calling to to be obedient to yeah. to my grandfather. Yeah. Um, and then there was, uh, as I grew older, there were certain things that I didn't agree with. But again, I would be mute, you know, about it. Like the and, and there was, yeah, yeah. oh, definitely. <laughs> and with my grandpa, it was not a battle. It was a straight out war. Yeah, yeah, you know, we yeah. knew, like, you wanted to start it? Ooh, you yeah. better be ready for everything, you know? Yeah. So, um, so there was a situation where uh, I wanted to do something. Or I had done something. I think it involved alcohol. Okay. Yeah. It involved alcohol where I wanted some. And my grandfather, being um, my grandfather, already had his experiences and believed that as a woman, mm -hmm. I should not, yeah. you know, Be partake or whatever. Yeah. Um, he also had ideas about marriage yes that i was supposed to like even though i felt like he was pretty he was pretty forward thinking mm -hmm. there were parts of his thinking that were still very rooted in you know i guess very very traditional very antiquated and so we kind of clashed over that but again i never picked it yeah and i know it involved that and it was because um it was over someone that they wanted me to marry mm -hmm. and I did not want to. So, and so, so I was a, a arranged marriage? Pretty much. <laughs> okay. And so All right. um, during that time I got more and more vocal, you know, because that was something that was against what I wanted. I did, was Can you kind of get more in depth like how did they how did they bring that subject? Did you just hey they just told you straight up hey they want you to marry this person? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Kind of straight up, yeah. Yeah. I never knew this person in my life wow. before. I didn't even go to church with this person. Yeah, yeah. Where is this person from? If you end up what I'm asking. 
Um, I don't think I want to mention that. But uh, was it from, from the States? Was States or no, 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 from Toma. Yeah, 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 which is why, you know, that's obviously yeah. what I was kind of expected. Gotcha. Um, so when they did this, I kind of went into a little spiral. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no. So everything that they wanted me to do, I, I did it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I knew they didn't like alcohol. Yeah. I would do that coming, like on my flights back and forth from New Zealand or yeah. Hawaii or wherever I was going. Just because it was... It was like my way of reveling. Okay. Okay. It wasn't crazy, but I yeah. knew to my family that was so, pretty much ultimate sin. Yeah. Because you, you didn't want to get married to that person. Right. Gotcha. So I got home and I was packing up my clothes. I wanted to go with another family member or with my, my mom's other sister to Gromotua and stay there. And my grandpa said something. And oh my Lord Jesus. It just, for some reason, it triggered the wrong thing in me it was like you know when girls drink they are and then he would say something like like pretty much saying that girls when they drink all girls when they drink and i hate they all, they being classify you guys. boxed yeah with other girls all girls okay because yeah. i feel like not all girls do yeah, that. exactly you know what i mean but he did that yeah and he so, so type of yes box. yes it was just like oh my god and at that point i was just how, how, about, how, how old were you at this time? I think it was, it was like my early 20s. <laughs> okay. I think it was straight after undergrad. Mm -hmm. And then I thought I was grown. <laughs> so yep. I tried it. Yeah. Ooh. I talked back and I went to the room to pack up all my stuff, not knowing that my grandpa had followed me into the room. When I turned around, smack that right into his freaking fist. Oh. He, oh my God. I don't know how many times he beat me, or he punched me in the face, but I did have a bunch of bruises. And mind you, at that time I was working. Yeah. So I went to work, and you know what we do when we're trying to deal with something that is uncomfortable to talk about? Yeah. We turn it into a humorous yeah, situation. Yeah, laugh about it, yep. Yeah. So when I went to work, he'll be like, what happened to you? And I was like, you know, you know, or like something like that. And you would laugh about it, but I feel like that was like my first intro into it. Was like a pretty rough one, but it was like my first intro into being like, Oh, damn, I can actually take the consequences of what would come if I do voice, yeah, or like you know, fight back, so. not fight back, but like rebel back to the institution, rebel back to yeah. what my grandpa thinks is the right or the norm or whatever yeah um but yeah thankfully there has not been any situation like that after but so um how take me back so when he you know when, when he uh when he, when he hit you when he hit you right mm -hmm. how did you feel right after was, was it shocking for you that you know because you put the he's like you mentioned earlier you put this man on the pedestal yeah, yeah right so when he hit you like how did you like what what, what were you going through your mind at that time did i justified just, it yeah justified, i justified, justified it. it yeah i was like this is what happens. You know that you're not supposed to talk back to him, and I feel like. So it wasn't more. It wasn't. You didn't, it wasn't more about the drinking. You just. It's just the fact that you know you shouldn't talk back to him. Yeah, it then became something super. You know, how do I say this? Yeah, it was something small, and then I, I justified that whole, the whole reaction and the whole response, um, just from me talking back. You know, and yeah. I feel like, as women. And as Tongan women, mm -hmm. I know I do, like speaking on my own behalf, like I justify, you know, stuff like that. You know, like I would, if I have a response that I'm not happy with or like cultural backlash, I will justify quickly, like even though I'm Americanized to an extent, the ra the Tongan rationale in my head like, will rationalize it yeah. and be like, no, 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 that don't obey because you know what I mean yeah. so I was like again it's for a very different uh, uh, you know yeah. to be American and Tongan at the same time yeah. you know what it, regardless of what space you're you grew up in yeah. or surround yourself with it, yeah. yeah continues to be a battle okay no uh, if that makes sense no that, that makes sense and then, um, no what you said like you kind of uh, is real because uh, you know I'm sure if you've heard out of I don't know if you've heard but do you have out of family members that go through uh, physical abuse in their relationship, relationships with their families 
Have, have you heard in your families from other people in your family, other other women? I can't comment on that. No, that's but right. I know like within like within <laughs> our family. No, right? yeah, because I feel. Do you f do you feel like a lot of women do this? Like, cause uh, especially Tongan women that go to have a abusive relationship with their husband or their family members. Do you think they do that? They, that's that's their way of of uh, dealing with those situations. Oh they, yeah, they justify it. It's a coping mechanism. Yeah, it's how they, yeah. Yeah, because like at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is understand. Yeah. You know, or make sense of something that you don't, you can't make sense of. Yeah. At that time. Yeah. So I feel like. Regardless of what situation, whether it's violence or not, and I'm not going to comment on that because yeah. you know that's yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I not, I'm not an expert. Yeah. But like, I feel like in whatever the situation, we as Italian women, we as Italian women, yeah. Um, a lot of people. This is something that could resonate yeah. across cultural borders. Yeah. Is like we try to justify things or make sense of things because we don't understand it. Yeah. You know. And the only way to understand it is what we know as far as our culture right. what we know so far as what we're taught right so if you don't you can only see as far as like, like exactly. or whatever, whatever that saying so is if, like like you said like if you don't know if when you're if you get abused by somebody in your family member you, you just don't know how to feel but the only thing you know well that's my elder mm -hmm. so it's you know it's then you just mm -hmm. kind of okay your condition to your condition just to accept what it is mm -hmm. um sure. i want to ask you a question so that's how you felt before uh -huh. If that happened again today, would you still justify it? Um, justify... No. Yes, I wouldn't justify it because now I know better. Okay. Exactly. You know? Yeah. My response would be totally different. Yeah. I was at a point where I was super sheltered. Yeah. Like everything <clears throat> I knew was within this space. You mm -hmm. know, I was in a bubble. Mm -hmm. That was the bubble I knew. So anything I was drawing on to respond to this situation was just based on everything in this bubble. But now that that bubble is totally gone, and like I, I, I get to experience other things outside of that bubble and see how other people react to situations such as that, um, I would definitely respond differently. Yeah. yeah. Did that change your perspective of how you saw your, gra your grandfather after, after that? Oh, just kept it the same? Never changed it. Okay. Because I always brought up all the other stuff, all yeah. the sacrifices, I feel all it. the good he's done. Yeah. All, like, you know those things because that I guess the reason why it was easy for me to go back to that was because it wasn't a common occurrence yeah yeah so when that happened I was like you know at the end I was like oh, how dare he touch yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean because it was it was new but I guess for other people that experience something traumatic like that on a more regular basis yeah that course, could be different yeah perspective changing right there you know like yeah the way you view someone would be totally different but yeah okay that's fine did he, did he say anything out there or he was just like he, just, he told you what it was and then he left and that was dude it. we did the silent treatment yeah <laughs> for grandpa is like tough love yeah. <laughs> but for some reason he was it was different with um with his granddaughters yeah you know especially me because i was his oldest daughter's oldest daughter yeah yeah. So like it, there was like it was like all love, you know, yeah. even though he was tough love. Yeah. Um. So, I know there was like silent treatment, and then I came home to him being interviewed, uh, in Doma, and then when I passed by him, he stopped his interview and he, he was like, yeah, I get out. Melted everything. I was like, okay, <laughs> good, we're good. I was like, eat, and then I just went in, but I was like inside my heart, I was already, it was thawed. I was like, okay. Yeah. But, you know, I'm just speaking from, yeah, you know, how right. I would react and how I, yeah, okay. it, within right. my experience. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, all right, so that's, that's how you grew up. Um, besides, besides expressing yourself, did you, uh, any, were there any other challenges just growing up as, uh, as a Tonga woman in, uh, in the United States? Was there anything you, did you experience in growing up that you feel like it's kind of a, a challenge? For yourself, besides expressing yourself, hmm. I think everybody, everything could go under that category. Um, but then, the challenge w would be for me, and I'm thinking of this from a pers professional aspect, is like, like knowing what part of your tongueness you take with you to the workplace. The balance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, like it's knowing what part of you you take and knowing what part of you should be just shelved 
because you're not gonna grow in the workplace. Yeah. You're gonna be, you know, stagnant, no growth whatsoever. Yeah. You know, like if you take all of that, you bring all that baggage, yeah. your tongue and self, into a space that is not, you know, that is not gonna nurture that mm -hmm. or is like made for that. Mm -hmm. And try to think that everything's gonna fit. Okay, this is a square. I'm gonna put this particular particular cultural characteristic into this, and mm -hmm. it's gonna fit right here. No, 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 it's not. You have to pick and choose. And there is no like checklist for like, okay, this yeah. will work in it's the just, American just experience. Right? This is yeah, trial and error. Trial and error. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about like you're the oldest, right? Yes. The oldest in family. Um, I know being the oldest in the, uh, I know as being the oldest in the family, there's more responsibility, especially in the Tonga family. Especially if you're, if you're the oldest girl in the family, right? There's a lot of expectations and obligations that you have to fulfill. Um, do you, uh, did you ever feel like that there just it became too much? Or there was like, as far as like the, what they expected out of you to carry the family, to carry siblings and uh and just what a normal um you know sibling that's the eldest of the family has to go through can you rephrase that question yeah so like you know did you you know i, I know as tongans like you know being the eldest is the, you have a lot of responsibility Full -time job? yeah it's like you know you're pretty much the third parent yeah <laughs> all right for sure yeah right so um can you talk about that experience of growing up as the oldest Mm -hmm. uh, within your family, and uh, you know the how you felt about the expectations, what you went through. Did you ever feel like at some point in time it was overwhelming mm -hmm. to keep? You know, of course you, you like like I said, you're the third parent. You have to provide. You have to mm -hmm. babysit. You have to take care of your siblings, and of course you pretty much just doing everything for your family. Like I just wanted you to t t talk about that. Okay. Your experience of how you how you felt as being the oldest, and what's your personal experience and uh, and challenges if you went if you felt like there was some challenges going through that. Right. Um, again, I'm just going to speak on what I experienced yeah, yeah, as yeah. being the oldest yeah, child within yeah. my tongue and yeah, yeah. <laughs> nuclear family. Yeah. Um, being a woman already born into, especially my maternal side, mm -hmm. lots of expectations. Yeah. And then you're the oldest, it's a whole different battleground. Mm -hmm. um, my mom was the oldest. Okay. So basically a lot of the way she dealt with her siblings like I'm not saying dealt but like for lack of a better term yeah but like how she interacted within that space as yeah the oldest sibling mm -hmm. and as the oldest sister um was the thing that informed how i interacted yeah. with with my siblings yeah. you know my mom she super, passed it down to you oh yeah mom super loving mm -hmm. she like can talk back a whole like you know to my dad she never did that with her siblings. Yeah. She loved the, like, those, her siblings, crazy, you know? And, like, I felt like that informed how I did, like, I dealt with my kids. Like, for me, no discipline. Yeah. From my end. Yeah. I never hit my kids. I yeah. call them my kids. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's your siblings, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, never hit them. I never saw my mom do that. Yeah. My mom was the type where her siblings would tease her, she would cry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Even as an adult. Yeah. Like I saw this. Yeah, yeah. And then after that, like that's exactly what I did growing up. You know, and there's, um, there's a lot of like, there's a lot. Like I, f I feel like the the biggest and the most challenging expectation as a Tongan woman slash oldest, oldest sibling, yeah. is having to be the perfect. And I'm gonna quote Oof. that hardcore perfect, perfect role model yeah. for all those younger siblings. That is like a burden that no one should bear. Exactly. You know, yeah. because we're not perfect. <laughs> we all fall short. Right, the exactly. Bible says that. Yeah. We all fall, we're fall short. We're human. Uh, it's a part of it. Like it's like part of being humans. It's yeah. like we're we're not we're imperfect. So did um, you so did you ever did you, did you grow up ever the whole time just feeling that you weren't enough? Um, maybe, I guess you could rephrase that by saying, like, I always strive to be better. To be better, okay. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I always strive to be better. Like, if I came home and I have one B. Yeah. Then you have, yeah, okay. I would hide that report yeah. card. If it wasn't all A's, mm -hmm. 
I fell short. I'm imperfect. Yeah. You know, and, and and like you begin to learn where like you begin to learn that like the kind of responses that you get when you meet that standard mm -hmm. in whatever it is that you're doing and the response that you get when you don't meet it. Mm -hmm. You know? So you kinda shy away from like that's not my strength, I didn't yeah. do so well. You don't wanna work on it because you don't want to be seen as less than. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You only want to show that side of you that's perfect. perfect yeah. That's made up. That's all that, like, that meets and ticks those boxes. Instead of being able to look at those parts of you that are not so strong, but mm -hmm. can be improved, yeah. and see that as, like, a platform mm -hmm. for you can, for where, like, you can continue to build, mm -hmm. so that it could also become a strength just like everything else. So, you feel, so, uh, in your opinion, so you feel like that. Uh, growing up, growing up with that expectation to be perfect, do you feel like younger, uh, in the early years, did that hold you back a little bit, as far as your growth? That did, that did. It kind of. If, if you had to say a little bit, or you say a lot. Uh, most likely, um, I would say half and half. Half and half. Yeah. Because I guess at that point, I didn't even know what part of what I was thinking was my thinking. Yeah as opposed to what you said earlier, something that was implanted. Yeah. You know, yeah. your thoughts and, and your feelings and everything is like so infused with your elders' yeah. teachings mm -hmm. and thoughts and mm -hmm. expectations that there literally is like, there's a huge blur between what's really your thoughts mm -hmm. and your, you know, you and what is them. Um, so, Oh my god, I don't remember what the question was. But. No, no, that's no, fine. No, no, it's just, uh, so you're the elders, right? <coughs> and of course, like you said, you know, they have the expectation that they want you to be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, we all know nobody's perfect, mm -hmm. all right? You're going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about a situation when you made a mistake and how that experience go when, you've, when you're when you trying to be that perfect daughter mm -hmm. and you finally have, you finally make a mistake and then you have to deal with you know, your parents know about it, and how did that go? Uh, how did that conversation go? When you did something that wasn't perfect, and then how did that experience with your parents go? I guess I'm gonna talk about the most recent one. Um, is like, so in my household, being raised by my grandfather, he always viewed we grew up from poverty. Mm -hmm. So many days of just use like manioca yeah. peke peke with the mako. Like they would, I don't know what the term is, like when you do the, uh, you know, those pieces of guaca and then you would get the mako and then you're peke peke yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. That was dinner for so many, yeah. so many times, you know? And and I, I know that's off, you know, the point no. that like of our yeah. conversation, yeah, yeah. but like that pretty much established education in my mom's family as the only way to make it. To make it. Okay. Gotcha. Climb up that social ladder. You want to, you know, move up to the next rung? Go to school. Mm -hmm. okay, the more degrees you have, mm -hmm. the higher you'll get. Yeah. Which is pretty much the, excuse me, my mentality. Yeah. You know, um, because of that. And, mm -hmm. I'm, good. Yeah. and like as a result of that, I continued to climb, climb, climb and acquired those degrees and I got to a point where I got into a job and I liked it. Got you. Teaching. Mm -hmm. And I stopped. Yes. I didn't go all the way. Okay. And for my family, that's getting my doctorate. So I stopped after two courses. It's like, I love this. This is my calling. I'm going to stay here. What did they say? It was very hard for my mom's sisters to accept because I guess one of the reasons or excuses that I used to stop was my grandfather passed away. Yeah. Like I said, he was the only reason yeah. why I yeah. wanted to, to continue to, to strive for perfection. To please him. To continue to make him proud. Yeah. You know, and then when my source was gone, was gone like the source of the pride and whatever, all that, it was super difficult for me to transition that even to myself. Yeah where I should have at that point, but I wasn't there yet mentally, kind of identified myself as that reason I should be 
the motivating factor for all these things instead of giving that yeah. power to someone else. The yeah. happiness should come with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so as a result, it was very, very difficult for yeah. my mom's sisters. You know, I mean, I've climbed so high like that. Yeah. I did yeah. all that. I mean, I gave them I gave them a master's for the field that they wanted me to go to school for. Yeah. And I gave myself a master for the field that I wanted to go for. You know, like yeah. it was just like super like it was intense. I felt like I was just a lifelong student. Yeah. You know, I was like in my late twenties, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then when grandpa passed, it stopped. Yeah. Everything passed, you know. It's good, yeah. All right, so um, that's very powerful. So, uh, so your um, your aunties wanted you to climb the the social ladder. They want you to get your degrees. Mm -hmm. um, you're in the process of getting your doctorate. You realize was it two credits in or two classes in that uh, teaching was your calling, and and you found happiness in it. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so how did that? How did that? whole journey how did that process of actually letting them know hey i'm no longer going to continue getting a doctorate uh, getting a doctorate and i wanted to uh, kind of go, uh, talk about how was your response was it was it uh, was it something that they kind of just let you was it was it really difficult in the beginning and eventually they kind of eased into it and accepted it, or is it just still an ongoing issue right now where it's still something that's very it's an elephant in the room every single time you come in if you want to talk about okay. that yeah for sure um, so thank you for the question. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, the the expectations was there as oldest Tongan mm -hmm. child, uh, Tongan female child, mm -hmm. to make sure um, I climb that academic slash social ladder yeah. and get as many degrees as I possibly could. Yeah. Basically, culminating in a doctor, right? Yeah. Because according to all Tongans that I guess, or like what is that's families that's such as mine. That's, I think that's all cultures, right? The, the degree, going to school and getting a degree, doesn't matter what culture you're at. That's, that's like the ultimate uh, pinnacle of, of being successful mm -hmm. is getting a college degree. Right. And you, and you see not only with our culture, but every culture. Especially if you come up from nothing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Especially you if you come from, come from like a third world country, a small country. Oh, yeah. That's every right. immigrant, immigrant parent. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And so, like, like, going back to your question, you asked about how that journey was. Um, when I got to the point where I realized that um, there were some things that came up and I knew I had to get a job. Mm -hmm. I had to find a job, which I did, um, or I, t I found a teaching job. And then I started, mm -hmm. you know, juggling that with classes. And it got to a point where there's something in the Bible that mentions you can't talk to two or two Yeah, start two masters. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I love that story. Yeah. yeah. That's they true. get, they get yeah. And that's what happened with my situation. Because what I used to be, like what I used to revere, which was getting those academic um, accolades, yeah. that was my otua, became like second fiddle to my teaching gig because yeah. that was my passion. Yeah, that's your passion. That's what makes you happy. Yeah. 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 Totally. Like, um, and it continued to do that where it got to the point where I had that um, uncomfortable conversation and I'm not gonna lie my like I said my mom my, I call all of them mom so like my moms they are very strong opinionated mm -hmm. like just amazing women yeah no they're, yeah. They're, strong yeah, yeah, they raise strong you. Yeah, yeah um and I guess my willingness to make my grandpa proud kind of like transferred to my three my mom's three sisters yeah. you know and so it, it, it was a, it, that reason was able for them to understand yeah was it was a, at least a way for you yeah. to kind of like ease it yeah because you didn't have that you know, like. yeah <laughs> so so thank god yeah that something came up where i could use that as like oh to justify to justify it, yeah you know and make and ease that pain or yeah. you know yeah for them so uh, it, I mean, they were kind of more open yeah, than yeah. they will usually would have yeah, been yeah. if i had came out to them and been like i'm, I'm sorry on. your dream not my dream yeah you know like maybe i do further down but like down the line but what i where i'm at right now is giving me peace is keeping me sane is like fulfilling me in a way that 
I wasn't feeling like I was getting fulfillment. Like, or like, like fulfilling me in a way that I wasn't being fulfilled before, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I guess that's what happens when you come across your calling. Yeah. You know, when you find that job that does not feel like a job and you wake up in the morning wanting to go yeah. to that job, it no longer is a job. Yeah. You know, like you said, it's like your calling. Yeah, it's your passion. You don't see it as work. It is not. Yeah, it's like, like, you're like enjoying that's, it. That's how I felt yeah. ever since I started that job. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like five years here teaching in the United States in different places, in different cities, and, and like, I've never looked back after mm -hmm. that. It is an elephant in the room where like at certain points when we have conversations um, before I even go into that, like I guess another thing that eased that transition from like, or like telling them that, okay, I don't want to do this. Like we were parting ways in terms of like the expectations piece. I, one of the reasons why was because I was away from home. Yeah. I was here. I think if I was within, was if I was within, like or like at home with them, with them, or like I depended on depended on them for everything, it would have been a whole different story. Yeah, I would not have been able to bite the hand that feeds me. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah. But because I I left the country and I came here, it was then more easier for me. I feel like I I grew backbone, you know, to uh, be able to. Uh, that that makes know, sense. Cause I feel like a lot of parents use that um, as their. Uh, when they when they when their kids don't do what they want, they yeah. use that as a, as like their leverage, right? Or they'll guilt trip you. You guilt trip you, like, hey, I feed you, I clothe you, yeah. you live in my house, you gotta do, do what I say. Yep, yeah. yep, I for sure, it. for sure. And so it eased the transition, or like me moving from focusing on academics to my career, and still an elephant in the room. I know, just like a few months ago, um, I had a family member suggest that. Well, you don't have to work anymore. Um, you don't have to work anymore. You have two more siblings, in, like that are in college and they're almost done with school because I pay for their tuitions. Um, and like, you should be good. Like right now, your your siblings, some of your siblings are already working and they're good. They could take care of that, and then you can come and finish your doctorate. Yeah. And I'm like, no. Yeah. You know, like I don't even I don't even bother to go into like a whole conversation yeah, yeah. about it. I'm just like. No, oh, it's okay, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then, but yeah, so that's where it's at now. It's still an uncomfortable topic because honestly, there's still that part of me inside of me that's like really wants to do it for them. But that's just your, but that's just your heart. Like, and for you myself, yeah. Because Basically, you, yeah, because we love our parents, right? We want to, we want to, we want to please them, you know. But at the for same real. time, like like I said, it's two, it's two masters. You know, we know for a fact I, have to, I can't serve this master because yeah. I won't be able to do my best. At this point, yeah. Like, if I can't love both, then I'm going to just go with the one that I do. You know, because we, all, I we all have a sense of pride of the work we do. Yeah, you know, we can. We can't go into something that I know I'm not going to put my best effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, it ended up disappointing everybody. Everybody, especially yourself. Yeah. And your girl, you you're a critic. It's not right now. Yeah. yeah. So, like, hopefully, somewhere in the near future that could be accomplished but as of right now that's um that's not my my no. primary or priority goal or priority basically no no that totally makes sense um i see that a lot you know mm -hmm. within our own community especially you know the oldest you know uh i think like you said all parents all, i'm talking about all time parents have you know uh they have the expectations of what they want us to do especially when it comes to going to college and getting a degree and that's every immigrant parent's uh, dream getting everybody out you <laughs> know right? and, I, and, I, and I don't understand where they come from it's like they just they, that's in their mind that's they just want our parents they just want us to have a better life yeah. and so they're gonna push us to that no matter what the best way they, they know, they know possible yeah um, to get out of to get out of it yeah because they, they grew up in a whole different oh yeah with nothing oh yeah so, we could never yeah never yeah like, do what they could like they could do you know, I understand that. Yeah. Totally. And the reason why I want to, I just wanted to bring that up because I know the audience is watching. Um, I don't want them, I don't want them to hear this and make it seem like to turn against our parents. No. Oh. <laughs> no. But I want to put it in perspective, like our parents, like they want the, especially immigrant parents, especially yeah. if your parents come, come from the islands, they just At want the, the best, the they, day, they just want the yeah. best for us. So they're going to push us the best, whatever, whatever, the way they know possible. And the only way they know possible to be successful is just go to college. Either that or going to the NFL. But, uh, NFL. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But at the same time, this is America. 
you know, a degree is not the only form of success. There's so many there's opportunities here. Doors. You can, there's so many doors, there's a thousand yeah. doors that you can exceed it. Yeah. Um, you just got to be able to do what makes you happy at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. No, that's cool. That's cool. All right. So, um, all right. So, you go into teaching. Let's see, going to teaching, uh, doing what makes you happy. Uh, you mentioned you still support your siblings. I do. All right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So is so um, do you, do you, do you still do that, do that uh, as of today? I do. All right, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I take care. Uh, like I financially support my father. Mm -hmm. um, because being a pastor in our church, I think it like isn't able to cover the rent. Mm -hmm. So I financially I financially support him mm -hmm. and. Um, and of course, my siblings in Donga, because I have a couple there, and one of them is in law school, and one in high school in Donga High. So, you know, just to continue, like the tuition fees and all that stuff, we okay. just sent a box there, like little things like that. No, that's you know, fine. That, that's fine. That's respect. That continues to be. <laughs> actually, there's actually a. I want to actually actually ask you about that because I think my last interview with uh, Monica, mm -hmm. we talked about this. Um, you know, Polynesians, we know we that's this is the way we are. We help each other. Right? Oh, yeah. We have to help each other, uh, and that's a great, and that's a great thing about Polynesia. We have this calling to help and love each other, and that's what I love about our people. Oh, all right. Same. Um, but there's also a flip coin to it. It can also be a reason why you can hold back people back from as far as growth, mm -hmm. because sometimes you know, as Polynesians, we give too much, um, and then something to, to the point where we're suffering ourselves, and we're not actually hurt, we actually suffer more than the people we're trying to help. Mm -hmm. Because we just don't know how to say no mm -hmm. to, to take care of ourselves. So, um, do you ever feel like that sometimes when you, uh, especially when it comes to helping, um, you know, ob obligations that's expected from you? Mm -hmm. uh, do you ever feel like that sometimes? You're like, you know, uh, or you know how to balance it because it's different for everybody. Right. Do you know how to balance of self love to take care of yourself so mm -hmm. you're financially, emotionally stable mm -hmm. and still be able to um, do, my part. do your part and also help out your, your siblings, your family? Mm -hmm. Um, like what's your thoughts about that and uh, how do you do it? Okay. So again, it's going to go back to Donga, mm -hmm. grandfather. Mm -hmm. Growing up, this man was all about Fuaka Venga for the church. Mm -hmm. We start, or like he would start saving money for Misinale, mm -hmm. maybe the year before, right after that other yeah. Misinale, start, start saving. Yeah. They're going to get the Minma, they're going to get the Homofulu. He will start saving all the way through so that by the time it got to the next Nale, he would have something, yeah. of course, so that his children could complement like by giving a little yeah. bit more mm -hmm. to make it a certain amount, but he would have something for himself. Mm -hmm. And like there were days, many of those days, where there was no gas to take us to school because um, we lived in he like the central part of Yeah. Uh, How far was the school from your home? Probably about 20, 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So like... We didn't have utu or like gas money. We didn't have like kiki. Like there were so many things. So how'd you guys go to school? And no, it's either my my mom's sister would go to like a family member next door and oh, be yeah. like, oh, can the kids ride. catch okay. a ride with cool. You know, that kind of stuff. And then so like, I do remember that. Yeah. Um, but that has pretty much shaped my thoughts and the mm -hmm. way I approach giving. Mm -hmm. I give until I have none to give. I have yeah. nothing to give. And it's something I try to balance mm -hmm. in terms of like, oh, taking care of myself before I take care of others. But I guess I'm naive enough to think that the more I give, That's true. you know, the more I give, God is going to continue to make sure that he meets my needs whenever it is I fall short. You know what I mean? No, I, know, I understand that. Yeah, I yeah. totally understand that. Yeah. So... I go in with that mentality. Like just last week, a few days before payday, or like just this week, a couple of days before payday, I'm like literally calling my dad, you know, like that. I need gas money. Knowing fully well, I went ham on relatives' different birthdays. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like I just did so much that I went back to my bank account and I was like, oh damn, like I need gas money. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I could be smarter about this. Yeah. I know other people have a better grasp of it, mm -hmm. but because of what I've seen at home, I, where I, I understand, yeah. it didn't matter how bad we struggled, we were not gonna touch that misinale money. Yeah. No matter what. And my grandfather was a heavy smoker. Yeah. 
he wouldn't even touch it for that. Yeah. He would literally go outside and grab like his little leftover cigarettes, kind of crumple them all up onto a pepper cigarette mm -hmm. and smoke that. Mm -hmm. And like we knew my grandpa. My grandpa don't eat yeah. like that. Yeah. That was his guy. Yeah. And if he could do that, sacrifice that for like because of his mm -hmm. annual Thanksgiving mm -hmm. then who am I not to be able to do that mm -hmm. so that has been my approach I'm not gonna lie there have been times where that comes into conflict with you know certain timings of like certain givings mm -hmm. you know or like expectations from church mm -hmm. but I'm constantly reminded that God continues to give to you so that you can be a blessing to others and like whenever you're going to need him or need something mm -hmm. he got you okay you know and again very it's it's very contradictory to yeah. you know yeah the kind of person that i'm supposed to be presenting yeah but like that's a part of but, me that yeah that's, that's how you were raised though. yeah you that's saw how that. i was you raised that and i continue to i feel it to practice that okay and i'm not gonna lie for me it works you know like like for me it 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 does like it does the job for me okay like if like it fulfills me that's fine yeah. when, and i find fulfillment in my ability to give without reservations yeah you know like it wasn't mine's anyways mm -hmm. yeah he gave that to me mm -hmm. or god gave that to me and like all i'm doing is just like regifting something that was a gift for me in the first place yeah you know what i mean yeah. it wasn't mine to keep yeah so that is my mentality when i approach giving and all of those situations i'm not gonna lie it's, it gets frustrating sometimes yeah. but then again i continue to see how good he's been and how he continues to provide okay i mean they did call him Stihova Siaila for a reason you know <laughs> yeah that's true he provides so yeah. i got faith in that okay that's good all right um perfect so okay so um so you were raised you were raised more uh with your with your um, aunties right mm -hmm. so so were they really with uh were they really strict on you growing up were they really strict or not really yeah they were yeah 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 but they didn't hit me or anything yeah. like they didn't i didn't get hit or whatever but i remember i wasn't able like there was a lot of things that like like painting my nails yeah. or putting on lipstick or yeah. little things like that mm -hmm. I know in middle school, it kind of like that went from Tonga because my grandpa didn't like that. It went from Tonga with me to Hawaii where like in middle school, dude, I used to like, because my parents weren't all about that life there. Like I had to like get a Sharpie and use that as mm -hmm. eyeliner yeah. because, and then rub it off on the bus home <laughs> because I get my butt whooped. Yeah. But like, you know, um, what was your question again? <laughs> but like, yeah, those no, were some of those, yeah, experiences. So you got to so you, I mean you uh, but you got your bachelor's right? You got mm -hmm. your bachelor's uh, in college. Mm -hmm. You know, for for a tall woman, that's that's a that's a big deal, right? Um, Is it? Yeah, I mean for I mean because you know I don't see uh, I just don't see I, I think I was um, there's a few I mean I don't see a lot of like every family I guess every family what I see in Polynesians is only like one a couple not everybody just gets a degree. Uh, within the family, yeah, usually just like one Don't or two. Priority. Yeah, just like one or two within the family gets a degree. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, as you were working, as you were working towards your degrees, um, mm -hmm. you know, working getting a degree is you know this takes a lot of sacrifice, right? It does. You know, <laughs> you don't you don't just wake up and get a degree. Mm -hmm. There's a process to it. Did you ever get to a point where uh, where you had influences from from your friends or circle? To do other things, but you had to stick uh, to your path to getting a degree. Did, was, was, did you find those challenges in, to ma maintain that path? Oh, there was definitely challenges, um, especially or there was definitely yeah. challenges in the pause right there. Um, but I had a very good support system. Yeah, my mom's sisters, mm -hmm. like because I had, you know, my source of motivation, my grandfather in mm -hmm. the picture, and then I also had my mom's sisters who were like the best cheerleaders ever. Yeah. And like since they all have bachelor's degrees, mm -hmm. it was like easy for me to um to be to find ways to be motivated from yeah. them. Yeah. To continue that that academic journey. Yeah. You know? Um 
you didn't you don't feel uh, so you uh, you don't feel you don't feel like it was, it was a difficult being a uh, Tongan uh, woman getting a degree that was it was easy for you was it did you face any other cultural challenges where people like would because in your community they say oh you, you can't do it because you're a woman you can't do it because you're Tongan did you ever feel that or you just it was a kind of just like a easy easy path for you to get it. I guess maybe I used the wrong word for easy, but yeah. then it wasn't it wasn't a difficult it wasn't as difficult because yeah. my home life yeah. was very you know, like it was I guess it was set up in such a way where it nurtured Okay. So you yes yeah, so like you said you had a family my teacher. Mind, yeah, yeah. Family you know what I mean? Yeah. Like so like it wasn't as bad. Yeah. You know, and I knew like that was the only excuse for you to be able to not help with all the um, the chores at home. <laughs> yeah, the studying. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that, like that was, and even my siblings kind of learned that yeah. very young. Yeah. Because that was my go-to. But like it was, once you have a good support system. Yeah. Anything is possible. The lens you can go and your potential is just like, it's super exponential. Like you, you know, there's, there's yeah so much ahead of you so much you can do with your life so much you can accomplish because your 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 support system is there for you yeah you know and like there were times where like i would like i just want to be a normal like i just want to be a normal 20 year old yeah can i can i go to a movie can mm -hmm. i watch a movie yeah i didn't do that yeah i couldn't do that. yeah because it was more like Okay, we'll make your food, we'll do all this for you, but you stay at that computer until all your papers are done yeah. for this week or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it it became a struggle just in that like it was more like an inner thing where I me as of course, me as like a young adult and my social like wants as a young adult uh kind of clashed with the expectations piece. But then because I guess my support system was super strong. They kind of like steered me away from it. They were like, you can do that after. And that kind of like made me feel like, okay, okay, I'll do that after then. Let me just focus on doing mm -hmm. what you guys want. Yeah. You know, I'm getting these, getting, you know, getting my school done and all that mm -hmm. stuff. But yeah, I think uh, that was my biggest struggle. Like, I don't even want to go into like, when it comes to like, uh, when I went to Virginia and I, Went there to sc for school and interacted with. Um, you know, I was part of Virginia. Other went to cultures. Lynchburg. Oh, I went to college in Virginia. Which happened. Interesting. Yeah. Small world. <laughs> but yeah. But other than that, I think I'm luckier than most in terms of like having the su support, the very strong support system support that system. I had, that allowed me to be able to fulfill those, you know, my like my dreams. Yeah. Academic wise. Um, and still be able to do everything else, but yeah, you know, support system for sure. Yeah. Um, I know one. Of, I know one of the main uh, things, uh, just my experience, with, especially when I talk to women in general, right? Mm -hmm. um, is this? Uh, do you ever feel like that you have to accomplish your life by a certain time or age? Uh, well, there's definitely yeah a time frame. Time frame. Know? I mean, we we all know women have biological clocks. Yeah. Because they want us. Sometimes it, it's well, it could be very you think, unrealistic. Do you think it's compounded in Polynesian culture? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Because everybody wants you to be married and have yeah. kids. Yeah. By and by a certain time. Yeah. But they also want to put a lot of different other layers in that. They're like, okay. We want you to have the kids, but we also want you to be a doctor. We also want you to have a job at this time. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. All of these things. And they box it up and they're like, okay, by the way, this is due by age 25. Yeah. You're like, the pressure. Yeah. You know, the pressure. And you're looking at your brothers and I'm like, he's nowhere near done the things that I've done. And he doesn't have a due date. Like yeah. they don't give him met or like time and boys that i guess yeah. that little time frame thing oh yeah well as they would yeah. impose on on tongue and girls they're yeah. like do all that but just remember your biological clock is ticking you need to have kids by this time yeah and, I, and i'm just like no very unrealistic but still very much a thing 
and you don't shade you, on people that have that. No, 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 that's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, you said it's just like, you know, there's definitely a, that. But I know, uh, does your parent, I mean, I'm sorry, does your family still remind you to this when day? When you're getting married, <laughs> not as often as before. Yeah. They are, some of them are just like, whatever you want to do to make you happy. If that means being by yourself, <laughs> go for it. And then there's like, you know, the few that are just like, uh, what, how old are you again? Yeah. Please hurry. I'm like, <laughs> whatever guys like stop but yeah. yeah there's always those reminders yeah because yeah there's standards I know. of you having been, been made something of yourself very very different and, and involves usually involves marriage and yeah. kids did it i know now you're more free and more peaceful what you do right now you said yeah it used to affect you early early in your life to rush things that you shouldn't have got into because you're trying to uh, reach that certain by, you know, achievement by a certain age. Wait, say that again? No, like, you know, <clears throat> when you, because you know, as growing up, like you want to please everybody, you want to hit your milestone by 25 or whatever mm -hmm. that magic number is for mm -hmm. everybody. Did you ever like, have, did you ever go into certain things and do certain things just because of that? Because you wanted to like uh, say, you know, you wanted a relationship or go to school or was there like anything that you wanted, that you did not because you wanted to do, you just did it because like I, because everybody expected you to do it by this certain age. Mm -hmm. did, did you yeah, ever, definitely school. Yeah, yeah, definitely school. Because I thought to myself, I'll do this by all the way up until I'm like 25 ish or whatever, and then, you know, focus on trying to find a person that you can stand for two minutes, mm -hmm. and have a family mm -hmm. or whatever. And but yeah, I have come across that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that'll be my answer because I don't remember the question again. <laughs> that's good. I am so sorry. No, that's good. It's good. Um, so, um, do you find a, do you have a, so you know you, you speak Tongan? You're yeah. very cultural, but you know I know you're proud of Tongan. All right. Um, and of course, but you also living, living been here for America, you know, a large part of your life. Um, is it? Have you found a good balance of? being Tongan and able to uh, be American as well uh, here? Or do you feel like sometimes that, uh, do you ever feel like sometimes like you can't, I, I, for me personally, sometimes when I first got here from Donga, I, I feel like that I was a f maybe, I didn't want to be too Tongan, even mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to be more like Balangi, mm -hmm. you know, more. But then now I've realized like I could just be both. It's just, it's just I just kind of be, be balanced, mm -hmm. right? Did you, did you ever experience that when you, when you came here? And like, uh, what's, your, what's, your, I mean, what's, your, what's your thought process on that? Of uh, being, finding a balance between to being Tongan and then still be, especially all the cultural values and expectations and cultural things that would be expected out of us, but still be able to adjust to American society and, be, and fit in and still do what we have to do here. Um, what, uh, what, what's your experience on that? I think my experience or where I was able to acquire experience with it is like um, I found people that could be that were like my resources or mm -hmm. my go-to mm -hmm. when I had questions or did not know how to interact in a certain space mm -hmm. you know what I mean like I would have someone I, I have an individual that I would contact when I'm like when I need to be more familiar with oh how do I like what is the expectations for being you know, like for being at this party with non-family, mm -hmm. you know, like like movies, mm -hmm. you know. I'm just pause. There you go. I'm getting hungry. Go, go. <laughs> but yeah, so like, I think the most valuable thing was um, me finding people that I could trust mm -hmm. to advise me on how to interact in certain circles mm -hmm. or like certain spaces. You know, I have that that person I can go to in the professional space. All right, so don't lie, we don't do this, but like, what is the basic expectations for this particular circle? And mm -hmm. then they tell me, and then I kind of like go through things that are more aligned to mm -hmm. what I'm comfortable with yeah. and what are more representative of, you know, my cultural yeah. identity. And then I go with that yeah. just because I know, okay, so this is things that are like, that are okay in that space. And go with that like you can do that there 
But then again, I also have like other people that I go to. So basically, I have resources, like yeah, so. human resources that I could rely on for advice and guidance when it comes to interacting within certain spaces. Yeah. I feel like that's the most valuable thing. Because yeah. when I first came, um, or like when I came back to the Bay Area, the people that I interacted with were like my grandparents, they're so much older. Mm -hmm. So I got that, that Tongan, like I was able to interact just yeah. like I would in Tonga. Yeah. But then I also had my cousins mm -hmm. born and raised in the Bay. Super like, you know, the way they talked, the yeah. way they dressed, you know, the way they interacted mm -hmm. was like very different. So in watching mostly, and also in hearing and asking advice mm -hmm. to people that you trust, you are then able to kind of build um, your own, I guess, toolkit of how you are like supposed to interact yeah. within certain spaces. Yeah. And I feel like that's what helped me was I got people that I trusted that kind of like eased that transition into, okay, this is no longer Tongan space. Yeah. This is professional workspace. Yeah. This is how you interact in that space. And then this is no longer professional workspace. This is home space. Yeah. Like, this is how you interact with that. Mm -hmm. So I guess I, I just got to credit the people that, you know. Your circle, right? And basically it's, it's yeah, literally I family. Know. Not what, <clears throat> You know what you said is true. You know uh, who you surround, who you surround yourself with. You know, the, the kind of dictates kind of what kind of future you create for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, the the one I want to ask you is, what do you think that holds? Because you know, you can, you know, I, I think you can relate to this. Like you know, most uh, well, I, what I feel, most people that come from Dongo, when you come to America, you come here to make something out of yourself. Uh, you know, you want a better opportunity. You want to have a create a better situation for yourself for your family. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially if you come from Tonga. Right. Um, as far as your trajectory for your life to be a teacher, you know, that's, uh, I know that's a big accompli accomplishment for yourself, but, you know, I don't see a lot of Tongan teachers. Um, uh, I think you probably, I, I can count in my hands how many Tongan, you know, female teachers that I know that do it as a profession, right? But I know in our culture we have certain jobs that most politics, like the average poly just goes into, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, if you're a woman, you know you see a lot of uh, ladies that go care, caretaker, they do caretaking jobs. With a guy, they do yacht day, they go to the airport, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with these jobs. I and mean, whatever job you have, you know you respect it, right? But I always feel like that as Polynesian, we can always do better, right? Especially the next generation, right? So, you know, in your opinion, like what what do you feel like what holds people back? Uh, from like Tongan girls that want to be teachers in one day, but they don't fulfill that dream of theirs. Like in your opinion, like as far as you know, for Tongan women, or maybe Tongans in general, based on your opinion, what do you feel like? What what holds us back as a culture? To like I said, you you you, I mean you you are you doing what it makes you happy, mm -hmm. like you fulfill your calling, and I feel like a lot of people don't live their calling. Mm -hmm. They live somebody else's life. They live the dreams of their parents. Like you said, they live mm -hmm. the, the ideas that's been implanted into them. So, and that's, I know this is a loaded question. <laughs> Pretty much, but it's good. <laughs> But what, in your personal experience and what you see, your experience for yourself, what is holding us back as a culture or the, uh, for kids or people, anybody that wants to live a better life, actually doing the things that makes them happy, accomplishing their goals and dreams, like, in your opinion? Okay. okay. So, I'm gonna acknowledge the fact that this is a very loaded yeah. question, so I'm gonna try my best yeah. to, to Please, answer. Sorry about that. As like, much of it as I can. I feel like this is really big. A good, mm -hmm. a good topic to talk about. Yeah. Okay. So let me start off by saying that even though that's the case here in America, mm -hmm. if you go back to Tonga, women are everywhere. Yeah. They're cops. Yeah. They're ministers and not the not the yeah. religious ones. Yeah. They're yeah. ministers of health or like yeah. Yeah. not right now, but I mean like they're ministers yeah. in like that. huge I departments. Oh, I see that. Yeah. They're amazing, doing amazing things. Yeah. And then like they're teachers, they're lawyers. I have so many friends that like they're lawyers. They're, yeah. you know, like all these amazing professions that are Tongan women in Tonga. But yeah, but for some reason in America, it's, 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 it's not translating. Yeah, that's tra yeah, exactly. I'm wondering why. I want to ask you. Like, I, I, I really don't know, or could say that this is like a definitive answer. Or like I don't yeah. know. Yeah, in your, in your opinion, like, maybe I, in your opinion, like what do you think? Why? Why doesn't that translate over here to right. the kids that grew up here? 
I well, probably one thing that could serve is like that is a roadblock is like um, not having that support system that you would have in Tonga. Mm -hmm. A lot of people came here just by themselves yeah. instead of coming with their whole family mm -hmm. that could you know support them um, and like continue to be you know oh like to provide you know the basic necessities while they go off and fulfill those academic dreams or whatever in order to become you know whatever it is that that role that they want to become mm -hmm. like whether whatever profession um, I think a roadblock would be not having the support system that they would have at home um, I think also the shift in priorities you stay in Tonga people live in their own homes there's no rent yeah you know there are so many different like factors that we can you know bring to this conversation mm -hmm. but like when you come here that that pretty much takes up all of your your family's like tokama you know just to survive the bills like yes like in, instead of like their focus being to thrive which was the case in Tonga it's here it's literally survive. to survive I feel like we, we kind of pull down the, the bar and the standards and we bring it so much lower with that being the end goal to survive rather than to survive and thrive mm -hmm. you know I feel like that is also another roadblock the fact that we we lower our standards um, we lower the standards because here like other things take priority yeah that if it was not something that was a, like if it wasn't something that we would have to be concerned about would make it easier for for us to be able to accomplish you know said goal mm -hmm. okay I think that's another roadblock um, I feel like navigating something foreign another roadblock if you are thrown into a space and told go and succeed without the proper you know instructions mm -hmm. toolkit like all of those things that would allow you to be able to do something effectively and make an impact mm -hmm. there is a huge likelihood that you're going to do the bare minimum or not be able to do it at all because you go in there unprepared okay mm -hmm. which is a lot of like i know for for my parents when they immigrated here you know that was the case mm -hmm. they had to learn from scratch mm -hmm. there was no handbook from a mom or like from their mom or their dad mm -hmm. because nobody lived here before them mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah. and so like they had to start from scratch mm -hmm. and because they didn't have all the tools and, and resources that would allow them to have pushed further or become or make something more of themselves yeah they kind of were like you know what i'll do i'm gonna do what i can to get by mm -hmm. but maybe i'll live vicariously through my child <laughs> like let my child live that dream for me while i just make sure that we get by from the day day to day you know yeah. so like that could be a roadblock um I mean, uh, what are, uh, I know you have a lot of siblings. How many siblings, how many siblings do you have? I'm the oldest of seven. You have oldest of seven. All right. Is, um, since you said that, I mean, since you, since you, uh, you know, you provide a good example, does all your siblings strive towards getting an education just like you did? Yeah. Yeah? Right now, the only two that don't, doesn't have a degree is it's the one that's still in school. That's still in school, yeah? yeah. Okay. So, we're trying, you know. All we want to do is not only make our families proud, but also make something of ourselves. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, like, what do you have to show for exactly. it? Exactly. You know, this yeah, earth. That's good, you know? yeah. At least something. Yeah. And basically, that's the only, I guess, basically, the, that's the only way we know how to do it. Or yeah. come about it. Yeah. Is to go to school and then find a career. You yeah. Know, that makes us, and we're all doing, or at least us, the older kids, we are all doing something that we're passionate, passionate about. That's good. One's nursing, one's in the military, I'm in teaching, like, you know, things like that. No, that's good. So we're that's all good. doing something that makes us happy and, it and is it, fulfilling. And it's, and it's good, you, and you guys uh, create that environment, right, mm -hmm. in, in your circle, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's a good thing, I think what, what you said is true, because I feel like, you know, because, you know, I think, uh, like I said, when, when Polynesians grow up here, uh, you know, the, their parents come here, they're just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a lot of kids feed off what they see, mm -hmm. and just see that you know their parents are just surviving, and, and they're just 
living life and they just fall into that mentality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, that's probably why a lot of poly all work the same. Mm -hmm. um, jobs that don't really go strive for, for different opportunities because um, they're just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And I'm all, I was always just, I was one of, I was always trying to figure out like, yeah, like what could we do to kind of get that, but that kind of makes sense to me. You know um, what I mean? Like, yeah. I feel like- I mean, You grew up in a house full of- uh, Like a strong support system. Yes, yeah, a strong support system. But I feel like a lot of polys just don't have that support system. Uh, as far as- They the, could, the, the, but the they're just not home. Yeah, yeah support you know, system as, as far as pushing them yeah. to a different path, to, mm -hmm. to a, a, you know, a better situation, right? Mm -hmm. In the poly, you know, uh, I think it come, uh, I think if you mix it in with our faith as well, you know, you know, God, you know, God's gonna provide whatever you have, just take it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I love that too. But sometimes it's okay to ask, hey, you know, mm -hmm. hey, can I get a better situation? Can I go yeah. to college? Can I live my calling? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's what you said. Surely, I think uh, this the social circle of uh, of your environment played oh. a big role to your, yeah. to who you are today and the success you have mm -hmm. that you made. Sure. Okay. Uh, I think the last thing I want to ask you about, so, you know, kind of talk about your whole journey in life, you know, know. Um, you know, being the oldest, mm -hmm. you know, you have to learn how to express yourself, mm -hmm. you know, you got punched in the face. <laughs> I still feel that punch. <laughs> to this day. <laughs> the scars are gone, but, ooh, I still feel it. Punch in the face, you know, expectation to one. be perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, biological clock, you know, the expectation of parents of what you want, they want you to be. Mm -hmm. What I want to finish off with, one thing I know about life, uh, it never works out and we're going to make mistakes. So mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to talk about that, just finish it off. Um, you know, how did you deal with, how did you deal with your, your failures, your mistakes, times when, uh, you know, you disappointed the people you love? How, how and what did you do to bounce back? Because I feel like when people watch this, uh, especially Tongan women, um, I feel like they're going to be empowered with what you said. Uh, one of the biggest things that resonated with me with what you said was uh, do what makes you happy, expressing yourself, you know, do, uh, following your calling. You can't serve two masters, or right? serve the master that you love doing. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people gonna, are going to resonate with that and they're going to start on their own journey. But just like any journey, you know, you have to go through struggles and you made mistakes. So I just wanna, this is, I think this is more for my audience on what I want you to talk about, because I know in fact for, for a fact that they're gonna make mistakes. As, as you find your own journey, you gotta realize that you're gonna disappoint a lot of people mm -hmm. because your journey is not their journey. Mm -hmm. And you, you explained that, and you have to pick and choose your life and your family have to accept that. Mm -hmm. now, this, is who, uh, you, this is who you are and this is what you're gonna do. And um, I know a lot of people are going to go through their own journey, but I know the fact that you had to have some tough situations. And I just want to ask you, what did you do to, to deal with it? You know, are there methods or little strategies that you do or, uh, for you to pump yourself back up to, mm -hmm. to you know, give, you, give yourself confidence? Like, what, you, what, did, what did you do in the lowest times of your life and when you made some mistakes and went through the hard times? What did you do to bounce back? That's my question. Okay. So... To answer your question, mm -hmm. which is a great question, mm -hmm. there are obviously good ways to go about mm -hmm. dealing with struggles, and there's obviously not so great ways to go about it. Yeah. You know, um, the typical, you get into abusing like like alcohol, yeah, or doing things or like any kind of substance abuse. Yeah. There are all sorts of things that are unhealthy for you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing. That's one way. You know, some people deal with it. I don't, you know, with my struggles in that way sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I found that obviously not to be effective, so I moved on to the next. Yeah. Um, but growing up in a religious uh, and Christian, or like a Christian household, yeah, yeah. Um, I had to find my way back to that. Yeah. Because it, it, it kept me grounded, you know, to an extent. Um, and so, obviously, going back to that Bible, finding something that kind of meets you where you're at mm -hmm. um that definitely um another way i dealt with stuff was like um i had this my aunt told me about this story one of my mom's sisters um and then this is something i did like um oh and of course uh one of my favorite ways to 
I guess, to when I would go through struggles is like, I would find something to make me mad or find something that pissed me off about my past or people that made me upset or whatever. And like when the matter I got, it was crazy. The more productive I was, like it was insane, but it drove me. And like, I guess for different people, it's different. You know, you gotta find what works for you. But there was something very like that has stayed with me um, that my mom's sister did when she was growing up. And like, mind you, they grew up in like a thatched house, like made of coconut leaves, mm -hmm. the whole works, mm -hmm. you know? And what they used as wallpaper was newspaper. Mm -hmm. And in one corner, my aunt told me that what she did was she put up, or she wrote all the whys, whys, like, why do I want, like, why do I want to do better, make something of myself? Mm -hmm. Why do I want to go to school? You know? And then she put it, like, family. Like, she did all these things up there. And then that vision board kind of resonated with me. So now that I'm at that point, like, I put up something for myself. It's either through that or, like, in, like, in an actual notebook. I use that. I feel like that's very therapeutic for me. I like writing. And so... Here are my reasons why. Okay, I do it for my family. I do it for the love of God. I do it for this. I do mm -hmm. it for that. Mm -hmm. All the reasons, the whys, your the motivation, like the things that will motivate you. You know yourself better than anybody. Yeah. You know, you put that down because when you put your thoughts into words, it's real for you. Mm -hmm. You know, and I found that to be super effective. Mm -hmm. You know, that was my way to deal with a lot of different things. We all deal with things differently, but those are some of the ways that like that have and like one of the ways that has been super effective for me is is that you know putting it like writing things down mm -hmm. writing the things that that keep you pushing you know write it down speak speak your truth and and I like speak it into existence yeah and then it becomes real for you mm -hmm. you know if you just want to think about it and not put it into words and put it it does not become action you know but when you do you write it down it becomes real for you and then it becomes something that you want to enact because it's real for you okay and so i don't want to bore you but like no. that is like basically my how the way doing? i would okay how you doing okay that's fine i want to ask dealing with stuff you know, right. sounds good i think uh, i think what you said i think it was really really um uh powerful uh you said something about uh you think about something that makes you angry mm. right i know a lot of people you know, if you if you ever listen to like you know positive, uh, suffer, um, you know, probably you know the motivational speakers you know talk about positivity. A lot of them will always say talk about be positive. You know, talk, think about good thoughts. But I think I think I heard one one person say, anger is a good anger is a good emotion to change your life. Is that thing say what the seed of change comes comes from like discontent when you're like mm -hmm. when you're angry at something you uh, it's a sign that you want to like you can't change your life unless you get angry at something. And if you can't tolerate, if you, yeah. yeah. If you tolerate it, then you're never gonna change. You have to get to a point where you're like, what angers you? It angers you. When you get to that that point, that's when you get. That's when you be able to change. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sure. that's. I think that's good. So like, you, you totally know, if you're agree. angry, don't. That's a sign. Use it. <laughs> Use that as a driving force. You know. <laughs> right. Just. Yeah. To right. yourself. Yeah. You know, don't express it to nobody else. Ex just express yeah. it to yourself. <laughs> nobody wants to hear. Keep it internally. Nobody wants to hear you. Wants to hear your shit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> just give it to yourself. You be angry at yourself. <laughs> yeah. But that's a good point. I like what you said. Like, you know, you use that anger. And I know sometimes people see anger as the opposite, but no, I think it's good to be angry at something. Because that lets you know that it's time to change something and don't mm -hmm. dwell on it. Okay. But uh, besides that, uh, yeah, it's pretty much coming to a close. Um, any last uh, words or advice that you want to speak to any other Polynesians out there, or just you know, people that are watching, uh, or you know, or the Tongan females out there. Anything you want to leave off at the end? At the, uh, do you want to say any kind of last words, at last advice? I guess my last, um, some last words for like our Tongan audiences in yeah. general, yeah. guys and yeah. girls. Yeah, so guys and girls. Yeah. It's never too late to be what you want to become. Oh, that's powerful. You know, yeah. it's never too late to be what you want to become. Don't let nobody have that power over your life where they tell you that you can only do this at this certain age, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't do it after that. Yeah. No, do not give anybody that power. That power should only reside within yourself. You're the only person that should have that power to dictate 
what you want to do and at what pace. Yeah. Okay? And super important, find something that you're super passionate about mm -hmm. because then what is supposed to be a job becomes like a blessing for you yeah. and it's like you do you go to work just infused with yeah. you know passion and the willingness to do that and then more mm -hmm. just because it's something that it's it's what you want it makes you happy yeah. so don't settle for anything other than what fulfills you and and, and brings and you know and, and that ignites that fire within you yeah stay right. passionate all right, okay all right <laughs> All right, sounds good. All right. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. We call Thank it you. a day. All right.